afternoon. I might just start with a couple of technical points because I've just had a couple of emails. First of all, just to note that all attendees, because this is a Zoom webinar, that all attendees' webcams are disabled by default and that the only enabled webcams are those of speakers. So hopefully that will help with um, people with limited bandwidth. Also, just to note that the, the chat function, which I'm glad to see many people are now using, that we would encourage you to please discuss the webinar and the presentations using the chat function throughout today's webinar. However, if you do have a more specific question for our speakers, we would ask that you use the Q&A function because that will allow us to track the questions. And then please uh, feel free to address questions to any of our specific speakers. And then myself and Una at the end of the, the webinar and the Q&A session will try to address all of those questions. Um, if you do have any technical issues, please feel free to send me a chat directly using the chat function or to email me and hopefully we'll be able to help you with that. Um, other than that, on behalf of Engineers Ireland, we're delighted that we have such a fantastic lineup of speakers that Engineers Ireland as the professional body for engineers places a very high importance on assisting higher education in the educational formation of engineers. And as Deputy Registrar, I'm delighted to, um, to participate in this event. So now I'll hand you over to our chair for today, who's uh, Una Parsons. Thank you. Fantastic, uh, Richard. Thank you for that. And Richard, I just see one question coming in. Is there any audio um, uh, from Shane Murray there? So um, Shane, you should be able to hear us, uh, but you won't be able to speak, is my understanding. Okay, uh, we'll get started. Uh, uh, welcome everybody. I can see now we've 134 attendees, which is fantastic from all over the country and outside the country as well. So uh, great to see so many of you here online. Uh, my name is Una Parsons. I'm chair of the Engineers Ireland Academic Society and head of faculty of engineering and design at the Institute of Technology here in Sligo. Um, it was nearly a year ago in October 29 when Engineers Ireland hosted a very stimulating conference on the future of engineering education. Already then, we were hearing of examples of the transformation of engineering education and what was happening around the world. And an outcome of that conference was the reforming of the academic, the reforming of the academic society, which had not been active since 2008. So we formed a committee with representatives from institutions and bodies all over Ireland and met a number of times, uh, both in Clyde Road uh, and virtually since. We agreed that the Academic Society is a network of academic engineers and engineers in industry with an interest in teaching and learning. We agreed that the mission would be to promote the professional development of academic engineers and the advancement of academic standards in engineering. Members of the Academic Society can share ideas and experiences on career development the latest teaching and learning methods, and the recognition of best practice. So it is really, really timely in the current environment that we're coming together like this. So the, the, the committee initially planned a, a large physical education conference, similar to the one held in Clyde Road last year. But, but when COVID-19 struck, we, we changed our plans and started to uh, uh, decide that we should run uh, short webinars. And, and today is the, the first one of those. There were so many topics that we could uh, choose from, um, but we said because the academic year is starting now and all over the country now, we're all figuring out what ways and finalizing our plans with students starting on the 28th of September. So we decided that one of the most important ones and appropriate ones for us to start at this stage was the one that we're doing today on remote and virtual laboratories, equipping students for hands-off lear learning. Um, so next slide, please, Richard, please. So you can see uh, noted on, uh, on the first slide, and Richard said it, that we're um, our, we are recording the webinar and um, it will be available in, in the not too distant future on the Engineers Ireland TV channel. And if you're not a member of Engineers Ireland, you can request the YouTube virtual link via uh, sector support at engineersireland.ie. So we're delighted to have uh, four speakers with us today. Um, 
We start by covering uh, inputs from the Academic Society, uh, a survey we did, and uh, Irene Hayden is going to present that. And we will follow with a couple of international speakers. Luis, we're delighted to have you join us from Spain, and Michael Doherty in the, in the UK. And we will, uh, our final speaker is Brian Mulligan, uh, who would I call a, a treasure in innovation, innovating in online delivery of education in Ireland. So each speaker has 15 minutes, and I will give a gentle reminder if they go over that. And we finish uh, the discussion uh, with a, with a Q&A, a Zoom Q&A um, that um, Richard has explained. If you have any questions specific to the panelists, you, you might type them in there. And we plan to wind up the webinar at 11.30. So next slide, please. So I'd now like to introduce Irene Hayden who's a lecturer in the Department of Building and Civil Engineering in GMIT and is also a Chartered Engineer. Uh, Irene and Morrissey and I formed a subgroup of the Academic Society to conduct a survey on the impact of COVID-19 on engineering teaching, assessment and laboratories in Ireland. Irene will now present these findings. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you're all keeping well. I'm just trying to take control of the slides here. Sorry, just one sec. I'm back into it again. Now, to start out, uh, just to introduce, I suppose, myself again, and uh, Una's already introduced me, I want to actually mention our colleague, uh, Dr. Anne Morrissey, and the huge amount of gratitude we have for her um, uh, tireless efforts through the summer months, actually, to pull together the survey and the questions and reformat it, and can we work together as a group. Um, but in the back of it all, I suppose the... Um, Academic Society had been discussing this at length, uh, especially since March 2020, when all of our meetings, which were about once a month, had to go virtual online, as everyone else has did across the country. Um, and we, we recognised that we were curious, really, to see what impact lockdown had on higher education. So between discussions, we had many uh, meetings and the survey came about as a, a good way of trying to capture that information um, so to begin with, this is a presentation of the findings in relation to one part of the survey findings, engineering remote and laboratory, virtual laboratories. Uh, there was other aspects to the survey which we can present you know, at later webinars. Um, I think uh, as a group, we felt that that information would probably be the most useful at the start of this academic year in 2020, 21. Um, so to just to look at overall the survey responses, uh, while the survey was only open for two short weeks at the end of August, we did get uh, quite a good spread of information back from education institutions. 19 uh, participant uh, institutions were recorded in the survey responses. Um, and you can see it covers the length and breadth of the island of Ireland, which is great. Um, I'd imagine that if we had had the survey open for another week or two, perhaps we might have gotten a lot more data. Um, but we were conscious of the timing of the webinar and uh, we kind of had to wrap it up. Uh, to be able to process the information and have it ready for this morning. So uh, we have still a lot of data to work from. Generally speaking, the survey responses came from academic lecturing staff, about a 70-30 breakdown, the 30 being head of faculty, schools or departments. So again, we got a nice mix of information from both groupings. And the qualifications that people were offering in engineering, edu engineering education were from the National Framework Qualifications across levels 6, 7, 8, 9. So higher certificate, ordinary degree, honours degree and master's degrees in engineering. The disciplines that were represented, again, were very varied, and this was, I suppose, really welcome from our perspective. We had 16 engineering disciplines represented. So it really gave us a broad picture of what people have been doing in terms of their practicals and laboratory work, uh, you know, since uh, just pre-lockdown, during lockdown and after. So the three parts of the survey, again, as I just mentioned, we wanted to capture just a snippet of what people were doing in engineering education before lockdown, uh, then during lockdown, I suppose, for the rest of last year, academic year, and what people are planning on doing for the next academic year. So the rest of this presentation will primarily be focusing on points two and three, really to try and catch some information as to what people were doing across the country. 
specifically for engineering laboratories or practicals. And I, I probably use the two words interchangeably because, uh, you know, it can be interpreted differently depending on what discipline within engineering you come from. We are planning to future webinars in the not too distant future to look at the impact the lockdown has had on engineering education in terms of teaching and learning and assessment practices. So this is just a small synopsis of the overall findings from the survey data. Um, in terms of the labs that the survey findings were cap capturing, it actually went across 19 different lab or practical types. Some were indoor, some were outdoor, a lot of related to lots of different disciplines within engineering. So again, it really very much is a broad brush stroke, uh, you know, of what people have been doing to manage, uh, you know, in, in these challenging times, as they say. And you can see there, there's a nice balance, quite a lot computer-based or lab-based, and they could be computers uh, from multiple disciplines within engineering as well, not just uh, computer engineering. Um, to synopsize really generally what we're looking at pre and post lockdown, uh, the pertinent points really were that about 57% of practicals were delivered differently post March 2020. So once lockdown happened nationally, um, things had to be changed and about 43% stopped completely. Now, in the context of how they stopped, that was a, a combination of the fact that practicals had finished because the semester was over. Maybe two out of 12 weeks weren't covered, but they would have been used for assessments anyway. Assessment practices were revisited to reflect that and put greater emphasis on theory rather than practicals and so on. So it wasn't that they, were, they didn't continue, alternatives were looked at. Uh, and generally speaking, you seem to be extremely positive and varied and very proactive across uh, the higher education sector um, in terms of what people did for their practicals and laboratories in engineering education, which was a hugely positive finding from our perspective. I did some thematic analysis looking at uh, the labs in particular, and I found five recurring themes uh, which came up over and over again in people's qualitative feedback. So the comments that they put in in relation to how they managed during lockdown. Uh, uh, quite a number of academics and uh, heads of faculty reported simulations and improvisations were utilized. So it might have been a case that Excel spreadsheets were used to actually send out um, simulated data from labs and then those labs were used remotely um, to actually uh, continue with the practical elements. Um, lab data was given to students, uh, practical data circulated for analysis. We're just reading some of the quotes, practicals replaced by worksheets. Uh, simulations were used to prepare the students better for the lab. So again, lots and lots of really good salient uh, things were done there. There was a reported uh, increased use in technology enhanced learning, which I suppose would be expected when we all had to transition, whether we liked it or not, into online environment. And again, some really uh, excellent examples, you know, from the survey participants. Uh, incidentally, the quotations will be shared with the PowerPoint there in as appendices at the end of the presentation. So uh, if anyone wants to get their hands on them or have a look at them in more detail, that, that will be made available in time. Um, so in terms of technology enhanced learning, people reported using Zoom for labs um, to get remote access to their desktops. Um, a lot of reporting are using math labs uh, online um, and students giving guidance via videos and instruction sheets, access and software and completing the tasks remotely. So again, lots of salient points there. Some practicals continued with social distancing, whereas others stopped. And again, in this case, it might have been a case that practicals were made it into smaller groups and, you know, distancing put in. Um, social distancing was reduced to the number of exercises that could be accomplished in one sitting. So again, looking really at the module descriptors and the program board um, points to see the, you know, that everything was still covered, but that they were done more succinctly to make uh, time available and so on. The assessment practices in relation to laboratories were revisited. So in certain circumstances, there was more emphasis on theory than practical. So the shift of the balance between a final exam and continuous assessment and practical was, was reassessed to be fair to the students. Um, and uh, some people went more towards research rather than practical stuff. And the assessment models changed in general. 
And then the last point there, there are some novel solutions which seem to have come through, particularly in relation to taking home laboratory kits. Uh, students take their own home uh, lab kits home and collaborating with teammates using Microsoft Teams, which I think is a great idea. And some computing labs use virtual machine strategies as well. In terms of planning for the future, again, the feedback again did give information that, you know, it, it's still not resolved. We are some way or there, but there's lots and lots of questions that aren't answered yet. Most people who responded in this part of the survey answered a number of these. They didn't pick one. So some had students will come on campus one day alone working separately or in groups. Um, some who would have demonstrator practical simulations online. So you can see the percentages there. They're quite evenly spaced. Some would use kits sent home again, probably depending on what type of discipline of engineering you're looking at. Um, and some would use uh, software virtually online. And a, a good number as well chose something else. So there were variations outside of those solutions that uh, academics across the country are now looking at in terms of lab work. In for future planning, they're again looking at this Going through feedback again that we received, um, uh, practical classes will definitely still be held on campus for most engineering disciplines with the physical or social distancing and good practice in place. And that, that seems to be a concurrent theme from all the feedback we got from every institution across the country. There is uncertainty, you know, from management right down, um, and that is coming through in the themes for sure. It will be resolved. It's definitely in hand. And even over the last few days since we closed the survey, I'm sure that big decisions have been made in that regard as well across the country. There's a need for a high quality PCs among the student body. And this has come through on one or two points. And, and I think it, we would welcome, we would definitely welcome the government's scheme for new PCs, um, and which are really, really needed uh, for our students to be able to continue with their blend learning and remote learning online, uh, especially the, the RAM and the quality of the PC that they're able for some of the software that students need to use remotely. Students uh, are may still struggle with PCs offered in a virtual environment. It's quite foreign and they're not necessarily used to it. And it's something that we will have to resolve and take our time with to make sure the student body are actually comfortable and take a step by step as they go through their new pedagogical environment. And then the blended delivery using synchronous and asynchronous technology enhanced learning online will definitely be commonplace. Uh, you know, it seems to be apparent in the practical and laboratory setting in engineering education. And we expect more solutions to come to the fore. There was some really very brilliant uh, examples put through from heads of faculty around the country as well, which we can get into in the Q&A session if anyone is interested in finding out more. So just to conclude, um, the survey findings in relation to the labs and practicals, this next academic year will prove to be extremely challenging. There's no doubt about that. We will be looking for leadership and management, uh, you know, of a good caliber, starting from module uh, leaders right through to program board boards, programme chairs uh, and management and also our technical staff who are a huge support to us. We have, uh, we're indebted to them really for all that they have done since lockdown and moving on into the next academic year. They have worked extremely hard, uh, you know, our IT support and our tech support in the labs and the practicals. So just to, to thank them and uh, just acknowledge that that's a quite significant part of all of this to make it work. Um, the lockdown had uh, put us in, a, a, I suppose, a place where we hadn't expected to be. But now going forward, we have the opportunity now to look at uh, innovation and be more creative in how we offer our practicals and labs to students uh, in engineering education. We have, as I say, Zoom has introduced now um, our Engineers Ireland Academic Society. And it's a network there where we can uh, hopefully share and disseminate information and bounce ideas off each other and all learn together from that perspective. We can also look to international best practice uh, from CEFI, for example, to see how other countries are doing it because it's not just an all Ireland issue, it is an international issue, global issue. Uh, so we need to learn from each other as well. And, you know, personally, I think we uh, together we can achieve an ever evolving, optimized pedagogical evolution in engineering education if we work together on it. Thank you for your time. Irene, uh, thank you so much for that. That is very insightful, very interesting. And uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions on it. I can see a few coming through there. Um, I, I see them come through in the chat, just to remind you if you could put them into the uh, Q&A session if you have any particular questions uh, for Irene. And just to say, Irene's given an overview of the uh, laboratories and practicals 
part of the survey, but we did also ask questions on the teaching and learning and the assessment methods uh, post-COVID and plans for the future. So we plan to share those in future uh, webinars. So we'll move on now to, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Luis de la Tor Cubilo, who is a professor in the Universitat Nacional de Educación a Distancia in Madrid in Spain. Um, welcome, Luis, uh, to give your presentation, Online Labs, New Ways for Providing Lab Practice Experiences in Distance and Blended Education Context. Good morning. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So let me go to the first slide here. Oh, this is the previous presentation. This one is mine. Okay. So yes, as, as she said, my name is Luis de la Torre and I am today going to talk about online laboratories. So following the topic of the webinar, of course. Uh, you see, I belong to UNED, which is uh, an open and distance education university. Uh, as such, online experimentation is a very important topic in my institution. Uh, actually, I have been working in this issue for the last 11 years, more or less. And recently, I and some colleagues have launched uh, Nebulous Systems, which is a company focused on commercializing a system to allow educational institutions to easily enable uh, remote experimentation. So this presentation mixes two perspectives, uh, an academic one, the, the main one, and a commercial one. So. Um, I'll go through four points during this presentation. First, I will present the problem and the motivation for using online labs, particularly in my university, but also in general. Secondly, I will introduce the concept of online laboratories and their advantages. And next, uh, we will see a few examples of online laboratories that my group has developed during the, the last years. Finally, I will talk a little bit about uh, Enlarge, which is the, the ecosystem of solutions that we have developed in Nebulu Systems to make all these laboratories possible. So, oh, sorry, I skipped one presentation or two there. Yeah, so this whole thing was uh, born from, sorry, it's this one. Let's see, yeah, that one. Uh, so the slide is going a little bit, excuse, excuse me for that. Yeah, this one. This whole thing was born from, from one simple fact, which is that STEM, uh, need, STEM students need to go through hands-on experimentation activities during their learning. I think all here would agree on this, right? Yeah, of course, but uh, what if, you are considering an online or a blended learning situation. Shouldn't you provide your students with online labs just like you offer them other online educational resources? Uh, moreover, in an online and in a blended learning scenario, it, it is typical that students are not only at distance, but also geographically scattered. At least that's what happened with, with UNED, with my university. Is it in that case reasonable or even feasible to gather your students in a lab? Uh, the picture here in, in, in this slide represents the situation with my university where all our faculties and schools are located in Madrid, uh, but our students are all over the country and even in South America and in some European capitals. But not only that, not only that, online and blended learning students usually have jobs and or families and it might be difficult for them to you know find the time to do everything so these students look for flexibility the most and therefore making them attend um, to laboratories at a very fixed schedule and a very fixed location doesn't sound as the best solution for them but okay let's forget about all this um, let's imagine an, an ideal world in which universities are all face to face and in which uh, when a teacher says, I want you all at the lab tomorrow at 10 a.m., for example, then all the students are able to attend without any problem. Even in this ideal world, the time that students spend in the lab is often wasted very much because mm, sometimes they come unprepared to, to the laboratory sessions. They, ha they have not read the, the laboratory guide 
and things like that. Or teachers are busy when with other students when they need to ask something and so on. So uh, I think we can do better than that. So online laboratories, uh, after what we have been discussing here, I, I think it seems pretty obvious that online education should include at least some sort of online experimentation, right? But even in traditional, uh, even even in traditional uh, scenarios, it is interesting to to include online experimentation in addition to hands-on experimentation, not to, to replace them, of course. Uh, actually, nowadays, more and more hands-on labs activities are mostly done just using a computer software. Uh, the only difference here is that we are moving the student outside the lab. For example, today, the first panelist, uh, Irene, uh, showed that 32% of the labs in their survey were computer-based. So uh, this slide is to introduce the concept of virtual and remote laboratories, which are both considered online laboratories. Virtual laboratories are simulations. They are uh, you know, computer applications that run a mathematical model and get uh, theoretical data for the experiment, while remote laboratories, the example on the right, uh, in, in, on the right image, are uh, computer applications that connect to real hardware to obtain real data. So uh, I, I was planning also on showing a live demonstration of this, but I, I will run out of time. So if you're interested in, in this, uh, you can ask me to show one or two examples of virtual and remote labs that we have in UNED in the Q&A uh, round. So this is the structure we use on UNED with online laboratories. We can identify four main parts here. Uh, the experimental setup in the university at the right of the, of the slide. Uh, we also have the computer interface. Uh, in our case, we use web applications so that students only need uh, the web browser to, to run the, the online laboratory, so they do not need high quality PCs. For example, as it was mentioned before, they can even do that with uh, you know, a, a tablet or a, smartf a smartphone. Then the third part is the online course with all the educational resources and activities, your institutional e-learning platform, which includes all the links to the computer applications that you know, in turn allow the remote operation of the experiment. And finally, the last part are uh, the distance students who can access and use all these from their PCs and, and so on. So these are a few examples of laboratories we have developed in my group. Uh, at the top, in the, in the first row, you always have the virtual uh, laboratory and in the bottom row, you, ha you have the remote version. We always create these two versions because we believe they complement each other and we make students go through the virtual laboratory and when they finish with that, then they move to the remote laboratory. So they, they are all examples on control engineering. I don't know if many people here are from that specific field, but uh, that's my department. Uh, my department is on automatic control. So that's what, what we do mostly, but we also have developed some uh, virtual and remote laboratories for the people from the faculty of science for physics, optics, mechanics, and, and so on. Uh, I skipped one slide again, sorry. So at this point, I'm pretty sure that at least some of you are thinking, okay, Luis, I'm sold. Online labs are great and I want to use them, but how do I get started? Well, uh, there is a three step process to put it simple for creating an online lab or for converting a traditional lab that you might already have into a remote one. So sometimes people think that a remote lab is just providing the remote access to the software that controls the hardware. But uh, most people in, in this field would not consider that to be a, a real remote lab, a full remote lab. That's just the remote access uh, to, to manipulate it. But there are more things that we need to have into account. First is what we call the experiment connectivity. You need to use analog and digital sensors and actuators. You can plug to some kind of computer system. And you will also need a way to provide video feedback to your students, of course, so they know what's going on in the laboratory. Then the second step is that you need to work on the experiment autonomy. Uh, on the one hand, this, the system should turn on and off automatically when a student connects or disconnects to the lab, so it is not power on all the time. 
uh, for you know energy consumption reasons because it can damage the, the hardware and so on. And on the other hand, it may need to reboot, the system may need to reboot to a particular initial point or an initial state before another student can start working with it. And the last step is making the experiment accessible. For this, you need to allow the remote operation of the equipment and have some kind of system that manages the occupancy of the lab. For example, you can allow a first in, first served uh, policy for the remote lab, or you can use a booking system or, or something like that. But you need to control that somehow. And now you're probably thinking, damn it, this sounds too complex. This is too much work. And you know what? You're right. And, and it's even worse because developing and deploying an online lab is not only difficult and time consuming, but it also requires knowledge from many different things and fields that teachers and lab technicians usually do not know. They need to know about communications, about networks, programming, electronics. And, you know, teachers are usually very busy. Uh, I won't say the same about lab technicians. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? They are not so busy as we are. Uh, I'm kidding, of course. So, but then what? If, if it's so difficult, what, what can we do? Well, luckily we realize about all these and that's uh, why we created Nebula Systems and the Enlarge System for not only to allow institutions to provide their students with online labs, but also to make the process as easy and as fast as it can get. So basically, uh, the system consists on two parts, some hardware and some software. And for the sake of simplicity, because I just have like one minute left or something like that, let's call all these hardware modules uh, my gateway. This is an IoT device that we have developed that you can plug in your university labs to make any equipment you have remotely accessible. Uh, the software, which requires a license, uh, offers easy configuration of user policy profiles, you know, privileges, rules. Um, and also it, it also offers a wither configuration tool for defining your online lab activities that can then be consumed from any learning management uh, system. So in, in, in a previous slide, you saw the word Moodle because that's the learning platform we are using at UNED, but of course you could use uh, any other e-learning platform. So uh, this, Two things together, the, my gateway basically and, and the software I, I just mentioned, offer together a clean and a simple solution for the problems of uh, connectivity, autonomy, and accessibility. Uh, thank you. So that's all. And of course, I will be most pleased to answer any question in the QA round. Excellent. Uh, Luis, thank you so much for that. Uh, really insightful. Uh, lots of questions myself, but I'm sure the audience will have questions for you also. So we'll, we'll come to those later. So now I'd like to introduce Michael Doherty. Michael has a degree in mechanical engineering and is the academic account manager for Northern Europe with National Instruments. So Michael, we're delighted to have you give your presentation on transitioning practical laboratories to include remote laboratories. Thank you, Una. Um, just making sure everyone can hear me. Yes. Yeah, that's good, good. Um, so yeah, I'm Michael Doherty. I'm the Academic Account Manager for Northern Europe. So I covered UK, Ireland, um, the Nordic countries and Benelux. Um, so I cover everything in Ireland. Um, so yeah. So today I'm going to be going through a transition in practical labs to include remote labs. So there we go. So let's get this out of the way. Um, we have rebranded as a company. Um, we are no longer National Instruments. We are now NI. Um, we rebranded back in June. This is kind of a signifier of a long process and a lot of changes that have happened within, within NI. Um, and with that, obviously, we get a nice logo and also a nice new colour. So the evolution of engineering education. So we are at a unique point in engineering education history. Um, we have, you know, years ago, when you went to university, um, maybe 50, 60 years ago, you would learn about the codes and procedures that were required in industry, and you'd be taught by people who are, have really strong industry ties. Then we kind of moved on to the engineering science, which means you understood the phenomena, how to analyze things. And really it was about trying to get you into academic research. 
And that's pretty much what I would imagine most people on this call done. Now, we are at the unique point where the new trend within engineering is to move across to project-based learning and active learning. This is we get students into teamwork environments and projects that really try and push them to use their skills and develop their skills that are useful in industry. So with project-based learning, here's some of the things you would kind of try and develop within students. So you've got challenging problems and projects that then drive across things like student problem solving skills. It's And then, you know, through some of the other things as well, it's a student-centric process. And also it enables things like student presentations, which in traditional engineering kind of degrees, the ones that add, the one that I've done, we didn't really do a lot of presentations and presentation skills are something that are very important within industry now. So these are the three different examples of how we see you can do the project-based learning. So you've got studio learning, remote education and flipped classrooms. Now, I know there was a question around flipped, uh, Brian answered the flipped classrooms. Um, so I'll go over that a little bit. So studio learning, this is where students um, are pushed to take on challenges that are beyond their current knowledge. And really, it's allowing the educator, um, so somebody in this call, um, it's for your job to try and guide them to getting the correct solution. Um, and with that, you know, you're really challenging the students to think outside the box and really push the boundaries of what they can currently do. Then you've got remote education. Um, this means that, you know, like Lewis talked about earlier, um, students from anywhere across the world can, cut, can access the tools they need to do their degree. You've got examples in the UK, like uh, the Open University, who are quite well known. Um, the Open University have students all across the globe accessing NI tools to do an electrical engineering course. Um, I actually spoke to them last week. They have students from China who are, are able to log into the tools and conduct experiments at any time of the day. And then also we've got flipped classrooms. Now, flipped classrooms is you know, where it is becoming more and more commonplace. Um, flipped classrooms with faculties having tighter and tighter budgets. Um, often there's multiple engineering disciplines having to share the same labs. Um, and even within that, there's multiple different types of classes being run, try to achieve different learning outcomes. Um, and with one of our tools, I really believe that what you can do is in this space of a couple of minutes, you can suddenly go from teaching an electrical engineering class to something like a mechanical engineering class. But I'll show you that tool in a little second. So over the last couple of months, say since I'd post say since the beginning of April, these are some of the challenges that I've been working with my customers on. So will students actually be able to return to a classroom or lab in September? What will we do if there's a second wave and we need to go back into a lockdown? Um, how will we fund courses if students can't don't actually want to come to university? Um, and you know, engineering's hands-on. How can we teach students the skills if they're not on campus? You know, and, and this is the kind of process I've been working through people with. It's about having, you know, we need to have a flexible approach to learning. Um, much like you know what the workplace is now for most people, um, gone are the days we are in an office nine till five, and I think that universities are probably going to be the same moving forward. We need to be more flexible in the way that we work with students. It's also important as well that we communicate very early with students so that we can build their confidence, so that then they're more confident returning to university. For example, I know in the UK, Cambridge University, um, they have. They communicated out back in June that they were going remote for the full next academic year. And I know there's a few universities in the UK that have also followed suit. And then, of course, they've always got to embrace the change. Change is difficult. Nobody really likes change, but we've got to embrace it, take it on head first, and you know, we'll innovate and we'll lead the way. Oh. Right, okay, so we're going to look at some approaches to this. So we've got simulation-only labs. Now, simulation-only labs are good. They're low cost, they're simple to set up, and they can be accessed from anywhere. 
brilliant. That's what every educator wants to hear. Now, there is some downsides to this. Students, sometimes students lose the appreciation between simulation and actual experiments. Sometimes it can be, you know, if you're using a bit of software, you don't really get the actual physical getting into like, you know, build a circuit and actually do the experiment yourself. And we've actually seen from our own research that students actually feel that this isn't as good as actually doing proper hands-on experiments. And as a result, students have kind of lower engagement and they don't enjoy it as much. And at the end of the day, students at the end of the, are built in, well, I don't know if, not in Ireland or not, but in the UK, the students are paying for university. So they really need to see a return on the investment they're making. We do have something that can do this. This is Multisim Live. Um, it's an online web-based tool. Um, what you do is on it, you can build some circuits. Um, as you can see here, that's a kind of electronic circuit in the left, and then you get a response out in the right. Um, and it's, you know, anyone can go on and use it. Um, it just requires a code. Uh, if anybody has any other questions about it, I can walk you through what it does. But that's kind of just a brief overview of it. Then we've got connected labs that can be accessed from anywhere. You know, we'll, we'll start with the downsides this time. Obviously, room, labs that can be accessed from anywhere, in person or remotely, they do require some investment and obviously some work to make, to set things up. Now, they obviously, this comes back to people working remotely. Um, students have that flexibility to work both on and off campus, anywhere in the world. So gone are the days where, um, you know, you, if you want to get some Chinese students to your university, um, it's a lot easier for them to work from their home country um, than it is for them to fly over and stay in Ireland and work from Ireland. It also allows us to keep social distancing rules in place. Um, and I've got a use a example of that. It also allows things like group work and 24 seven access. Now, what is this tool? Um, we're talking about the Elvis 3 platform. Now, the Elvis 3 is an engineering lab solution for project-based learning. It combines instrumentation and embedded design um, with a web-driven experience to create an active learning environment in a lab, studio, or flipped classroom. And it delivers a greater understanding of engineering fundamentals and system design. Unlike your traditional bench top multifunction instruments and low-cost embedded controllers like Arduinos, Elvis addresses engineering curriculum by integrating project-based learning, teamwork, and design with course-specific application boards and labs developed by experts from education and industry. So Elvis is a programmable platform that gives educators the ability to scale to future multidisciplinary applications driving student employment. What the last bit means is, is that you know, mechanical engineers now I know myself as a mechanical engineer, um, speaking to educators and mechanical engineers, um, companies need mechanical engineers with electrical skills. If you want to become a mechanical engineer now, you need the electrical skills. Um, I've spoken to companies within the UK, um, Leonardo, one of the defence companies. Um, I've also spoke to JLR, and they're saying the exact same thing. They need mechanical engineers with electrical skills. And the same applies for electrical engineers. They need electrical engineers with mechanical skills. So it's, there's an ever-increasing importance for people to understand more than one discipline. Now, we talked about the social distancing use case. Um, I have a few more of these. I, as I, said, I can send you the cross and we can talk through them. With the NIL bus, you could have one student in the lab and they could have a webcam set up looking onto it. So that student in the lab um, could be on a video call like Zoom, um, and they could be talking to maybe two, three, even more of their colleagues um, who are on the Zoom call with them. Now, the good thing about Elvis 3 is it actually has a web interface, as you can see in the picture um, on the right-hand side. The students actually get a, a real-time representation of what's happening on the breadboard. So if the student in the lab is getting guided by student two and three, they can then guide the students and they can actually see in real time what's happening on their web interface. And one of the issues we were talking about earlier um, was that students are required to have powerful PCs. 
Well, you can see here that we can actually get students to join this via their smartphone. So it kind of takes a little bit of pressure off of you as educators as well. There is one more. Now, this is portable workbench devices to allow students to work from anywhere. Now, again, it's the same as the previous example. It requires a little bit of investment. And obviously, there's limited complexity of what you can do. Um, and it also requires you know, a little bit of setup at your end as well. Now, this does give students the flexibility to work both on and off campus with the exact same equipment. Um, it allows universities to give students a kind of option whether they want to be on campus doing the experiments or whether they want to be off the campus. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of, you can see some of the other kind of positives there. I'm not going to go through them. Um, you can see them on the screen. Um, I'm just going to show you what they are. So this is what we'd refer to as the pocket labs. These are student-owned hardware, potentially, or you can buy them and loan them out to the university. Now, I know from my own personal experience, I worked with the Fontys Hall School in the Netherlands. They use the MyDAC, the one in the middle. They give that to the, every single electrical engineering student and mechatronic student um, that joins that university will be given an NI MyDAC. Now, the way they work it is, is that there's a special price for the MyDACs if they're for students and they split the cost 50-50 with the student. And the student has that from their first year in university all the way through to their master's year, um, where they use it in you know, lots of different classes. And that's how they use the NI MyDAC. It allows the students then, if the students aren't feeling well, they don't need to feel the pressure of coming into the university or you know, with you know, the social distance going on, you can have some people in the class, some people working from home, and you're all working through the exact same experiment. We've also got the NI My Rio. This is more for your kind of project-based stuff. Um, it's kind of along the lines of, uh, I mean, the easiest way to describe it is it's kind of like an Arduino, but it's a lot more powerful. Um, this has got an FPGA on it. Um, it's also a real, it's got a bit of a real-time environment on it. So this allows students to kind of do that kind of you know, you kind of complex experiments and really get into the project side of things. Um, I know that the University of West of England uses these, um, and they're sending them out to students again this year. Um, last year, um, I actually helped mark their final year projects for students, where they actually had students design and build an egg sorter. Which, so it was actually, it sounds a bit daft, but it was actually really cool to see what these students had done with an NI My Rio. And in Analog Discovery 2, um, this is, we have our own version at NI. We own Digilent, um, but Digilent have their version as well. Um, this is a kind of condensed, I would like to say a condensed version of the Elvis. It has things like a DMM, things along that lines um, built into it. And that, again, is a kind of student-owned pocket labs. So just to quickly summarize in, um, there are three options you have in terms of solutions. You can go with simulation only, um, you know, like multi-sim live. The connected lab that can be accessed remotely. Um, so that would be the Elvis 3, like the Open University do. They have students from all around the world using it. And then you've got the student-owned pocket labs um, where you've got universities like um, Fontys Hog School in, in the Netherlands who are give one to every single electronics and mechatronics student. Now, I should say, this is actually a condensed version of a webinar we actually ran back in May. Um, so something that I helped set up. Um, I wasn't one of the presenters, but I did help set it up. Um, so uh, there is a link to that there. Um, it also includes an uh, uh, actual a demonstration of the Elvis 3, as well as some case studies that my colleagues talk through. Um, yeah, and if you anybody wants to kind of contact me to discuss any of this, um, I'm sure that Richard can send across my email. Yeah, that's me done, you know. Michael, uh, thank you so much for that. That's been really, really interesting. And I think it's great for us, all of us, to see what's available out there. And Some of us are more progressed than others in that regard, uh, but it's, <laughs> it's great and to, you know, have available to us those links and uh, to, for people to be able to make contact with you. I'm sure there'll be yeah. a number of questions later. So our yeah. final speaker is Brian Mulligan. Brian is the head of online learning innovation in the Institute of Technology in Sligo. He's originally a civil engineer working in hydrodynamic simulations. But Brian has been using technology for teaching in IT Sligo since 1984, is a founder of the Irish Learning Technology Association, 
and started the first online distance learning course in Sligo in 2002. Welcome, Brian, to give your uh, presentation, Building an International Peer Support Community for Remote and Virtual Laboratories. Thanks very much. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Oh, I seem to have some control now. Okay. Um, okay. I'm just very conscious after listening to those excellent presentations that I, I'm not an expert in remote labs. Uh, my responsibility has been for quite a few years. In fact, I'm not teaching engineering for quite a long time. My responsibility has been to develop online distance learning. And uh, we've done particularly well in Sligo in engineering uh, and in uh, uh, pharmaceutical sciences in those areas. And we have, even though we have experimented with labs in the past and quite successfully used remote access labs, uh, we see this as a blockage to development that we need to develop further. We need to minimize the attendance of distance learning students, which is probably quite a different challenge to what a lot of people are facing now. But we can begin to see the it, it has become relevant because now we have a challenge, which is uh, that people want to minimize contact between students and minimize maybe attendance as well. So um, in a way, to me, because I was aware that I wasn't an expert in this, this is why I got interested in the idea of building a community of practice, because I know that people need to help each other find solutions. Okay. Okay, that's a good place to start. Okay, um, this is one of the rigs that we've built. We have about eight rigs uh, that are remotely accessible. You can see from here that it's uh, complicated enough. Uh, you can see that um, there's a PC under there. That PC is controlling that rig. And uh, there's, I think, about three cameras on that rig. So the students can look at different parts of it to see what's going on. Uh, but you can imagine it was quite a job in both designing that and then constructing it. OK, so if you take the point of view of any one particular lecturer who's teaching a subject or a module, they probably have seven or eight of these challenges that they have during the module. So it's really just not uh, it's not feasible for them to achieve that. If you look at all the modules they have, um, I just the lights have gone out here. I'm just hoping there hasn't been an electrical cut. You can all hear me OK. Um, so uh, between the different modules they teach and then for the institution themselves that has a whole lot of them, the scale is absolutely huge. OK, we're going to really. Next slide. OK, but there are lots of solutions out there. And I have to say, uh, I was very uh, impressed or comforted by the survey uh, that Irene presented, because it seems like there's plenty of work going on in Ireland, and there's plenty of ideas out there. The thing is that uh, we probably need to share these, okay? Or we do need to share these. Next bullet point, please. So you can just go through the about five of those bullet points that will save me doing it. Okay, so these are various uh, these are various solutions that are available. Uh, so remotely accessible labs, simulations, they've been mentioned. The idea of virtual labs, I'm not sure if we really covered that, Michael or um, Louise. The idea that people can run labs with different parameters, uh, generate data, and then use a sort of a simulation that has access to real data. So it brings in the errors, the typical errors that are in it as well rather than running a mathematical model. Kits were mentioned. There are even people who have, we can share designs for kits, designs for rigs, and home experiments, I should mention, by the way. Uh, I haven't done, I think back in the late 80s, I taught land surveying to students. Um, so I haven't done a lot of lab work. I've, I've taught computer programming to students. That's relatively easy to put online. But my memories of labs are things like in Belfield doing the simple pendulum and physics. So th there's a lot of these experiments that we may be able to do at home with regular equipment that people have as well. So I just wanted to mention that as well. Another solution that we are considering for distance learners, which would probably not be so 
uh, probably not be applicable to our campus learners, even with reduced contact, is the idea of using commercial uh, training companies in various locations to run practicals for us. Now, there are lots of solutions out there, but the challenge for any particular lecture is finding these solutions. So in a way, next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, that's a good, oh, that's a good idea. Okay, so obviously there is benefits to collaboration and forming a community of practice. And these are the benefits as I see them and it's probably worth spelling them out. Uh, for starters, we could start compiling information centrally, having databases of solutions, we'll call them, okay? Um, uh, and we, we know we can do this with shared documents on Google Docs or whatever, you know, we can share these documents, we can get various people adding new information to it. So if you have a problem to solve, you know where to go, that's a good place to start. Okay, the other thing is that there, you may be teaching something like thermodynamics, introduction to thermodynamics, and there are lots of lectures all over the world uh, teaching that subject. You go out looking, you find that there's only a few uh, solutions there for the subject you teach. Wouldn't it be good to be able to make contact with these people, other people, and divide out the workload and you can get building to uh, build a set of solutions and share the workload of doing it. Uh, reducing costs is another thing. Uh, there is lots of free materials out there. There are things we can share. So that is possible. That's a, a benefit as well. Now, we may share, say, access to simulations and things like that. But a lot of it is about sharing ideas as well. Uh, and below this, by the way, just down below this, I've mentioned pedagogical design as well. I'll just, in fact, I'll, I'll sort of talk about that now. Um, uh, if you look, when it comes to sharing ideas, okay, fine, you might share a design for a rig or a design for a kit or something else, and that the other people have to go and implement them, those themselves. But also, I, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that if you look at the motivation for having labs. And this is an interesting point to dwell on for just a moment, if you don't mind. We, a lot of us lecturers tend to take labs for granted and maybe not as often as we should examine why we are doing these labs. There are multiple reasons for doing labs. A lot of it in engineering, I know it most for myself from having taught land surveying, is about actually learning to use the equipment, knowing which knobs to twist, and you probably don't twist them any before be, anymore because it's become electronic. That shows you how far back I go, by the way. Anyway, it's been able to use equipment to being able to explore hypothesis, design experiments, or to learn about, what would you call it, how, how dirty data is, you know, how uh, the unreliability of data and these types of things. So there are various reasons for doing practicals. And we may find that for some of our practicals, we don't need access to labs. We can actually reduce access to labs. And I should say, by the way, as we work towards, say, what, what I want to work towards, which is a community, an international community of practice, I'm not talking about a learned society here. This is, and I have a bit of a, a bee in my bonnet about this, you know, because sometimes I think when we get together as a group of academics, to solve practical problems, we often impose academic standards on this. This is about ideas, tips and tricks for solving everyday problems. When it comes to it, a lot of us may be academic experts in one particular area that we work in, but when it comes to teaching our students, we're practitioners in teaching. We need tips and tricks. So this isn't about getting together and writing academic papers about a particular approach to teaching practicals. It's about just sharing ideas. Next slide, please. Okay, so I have set for the moment, and actually it seems like no time ago, but it's actually three years ago, I set up a group in LinkedIn. And uh, it's there's a, a quick link for it there, and I'd hope that a lot of you would join in this. Now, I have to say, Again, I'm very comforted by some of the stuff in Irene's survey because now I know that there's a lot of lecturers in Ireland who have been finding solutions. So I'd like to see you in this group 
and sharing those solutions um, as soon as you can. So if anybody is interested in finding solutions or uh, willing to share their solutions, that might be a good place to start. This has about 300 members in it. A huge number are from North America, as you'd imagine, because there's a lot going on there. And actually, strangely enough, there's a lot from uh, Central and South America as well, uh, and a certain amount from elsewhere in the world as well. So I'd like, I have set up that community for the moment. Next slide, please, Richard. Uh, you may as well go through all those points there. Uh, there's another one down there, yeah. Um, there's a certain challenges to setting up an international community. Uh, I've set it up and there's about 300 people on that that have been sort of gathered up over the last three years, but it's not terribly active. So I have a challenge in getting it active. In a lot of communities, and I have been involved in online communities before, there is this idea of lurkers versus people who post. I don't like the term lurker, but uh, that has been used in the past, but it's people who are viewing and listening, but not less really getting involved. So we do need a certain critical mass, and I'm not sure what that critical mass is, but it's certainly we haven't reached it yet. Uh, we need to figure out what is the best platform. LinkedIn is fine for the moment, but it may not be the best platform. So if there's any experts out there in this sort of building online communities that have better ideas about platforms, we'd be willing to talk to them. How do we do the communication? Is it push or pull? One of the things about LinkedIn and Facebook and this is it's very much pull communication. Uh, you can miss a lot of what's posted there. Uh, so should we be using push communication where we're pushing it out into people's emails? And then if you do too much of that, you, people, you put people off as well. What sort of services should a community of practice like this provide? Uh, I hope I'm not suggesting anything in competition, by the way, to Engineers Ireland, but this is a very specific need in remote labs. And as I say, because of the, the getting critical mass, I, I felt that this does need to be international. There are a number of international groups in remote labs, but they tend to be restricted for one reason or other to certain geographic areas or certain things like that. I went out looking for a group to join and couldn't find one, and that was the reason I set this up. So what sort of services would this do well? Shared documents, certainly having discussion, people being able to ask questions and get answers to their questions. We could run webinars and training. And one of the things I think would be very useful is what I mentioned before, this idea of matchmaking, finding people who are working on the same problem as you and doing, and working with them, dividing up the work. Okay, sustainability would be an issue. It can be difficult to sustain a group like this on volunteer work. We're hiring a remote labs instructional designer, we, although we won't be getting him until after Christmas. Uh, we will allocate some of his time to building this group, or, uh, but uh, it's, it's hard to see how that will be sustained in the long term. So we'll see about that. Next slide, please. I think that's it. So that's really all I have to say. In a way, I don't have a lot to add about this. My own expertise is probably in general online learning rather than this. But um, uh, And as I say, because I believe this is critical for distance learning, and obviously now it's become important for campus learning and reduced, uh, reduced contact campus learning, that's the reason that I'm trying to get this group together. Thank you very much. Great, uh, Brian, uh, thank you uh, so much for that. Uh, and we will um, now move on to the discussion session. We have about 20 minutes for this, and I'm joined by Richard. Between us, we'll be fielding some of the questions, and there has been questions coming in on your Q&A button there at the bottom of the screen. You'll be able to type in some questions to us. So I'm going to start off with a question uh, for Brian. And I said, Brian, you've been working in online uh, learning since 2002. Is there any particular piece of advice you give lecturers to improve the, you know, the emergency teaching they did in the spring? Because everybody's out there and it's great. We, we, we have uh, had up to 170 people join us now this morning, all trying to get ready for the next few weeks. Any suggestions? In general teaching, uh, improving general teaching now from last year, is that what you mean? Well, you know, uh, broadly and specifically, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as I say, I'm not particularly an, an expert in online labs, and generally online teaching is uh, what where my background has been for the last 
basically 20 years, to be honest with you. And uh, it's only now we're trying to, we're being asked to apply this to the situation we're in now. But there are certain commonalities, I believe, between general teaching and labs. And one of the methods that we would be, I mean, some of the tips I would say to people who are teaching online is to communicate extremely clearly with your students uh, online. They may not all be coming to class. They may be coming to class for a limited time. So communicate extremely well. The model that we would be pushing, the core model we'd be pushing is sort of flipped learning uh, in order to reduce contact with students, which would be really uh, maybe record or get fine materials out there and give them to the students covering your content. Uh, give them maybe tasks to do, activities to do, and then meet them to discuss these or to solve problems, whether that be physically or, or, or online. In actual fact, uh, I'm giving a talk on Monday about what I call a lean approach to uh, teaching online during COVID. Uh, and I'll, I'll post a link to it here, actually, if people are interested. In the same way, I'd say about labs, one of the and, and somebody did post a question early on and they said, what, what uh, solutions emerging now in COVID should we be keeping later? And I, I believe the concept of flipped labs is a concept that's worth keeping for the long term. Uh, there has been some experimentation. It's, I think it's quite old now that has suggested that students who have access to simulations and physical equipment even if the access to physical equipment is less, do better on their learning outcomes. So we probably should be putting more effort into preparing students for labs, uh, whether that's access to simulators or videos, uh, maybe give them some sort of tests before they come to the labs in the form of a quiz. And then when they come to labs, they will do much better and they won't have to spend so much time in the lab. So I'd say the concept of flipped labs. So. Uh, uh, those are just some ideas I think that we should take on to. I'll, I'll put that, that link to that talk on Monday in the Excellent. chat area. No, Richard. Hi, Una. Yes, yeah, so I can run through a couple of the questions that we've received in the Q&A. Um, firstly, from Robert Hickey. Do the panel think that we as educators have a moral obligation in the context of the current pandemic to run all of our lectures and labs online if it is at all possible? Anyone want to take that? Well, uh, just to drop a few words in that regard, I don't know if there is a, a moral uh, obligation, but certainly there is a, at least a, a practical uh, necessity for that. Uh, so, because even if, if you want to, to make uh, your labs still hands-on, uh, some students may not want to attend due to the um, current situation. So, um, yeah, I, I, as I said, I don't know if uh, there is actually a moral obligation, but I think it, it's uh, in any case a good idea to, to, to offer them at, at least some possibilities to perform uh, online activities experimental activities. Great, uh, thanks for that, Luis. Um, another question I had was one for you, Michael, um, and I thought it was very interesting you, you showing us the example of the Elvis uh, tree. Is, is there any possibility uh, that that could be trialed by educational institutions? I'm sure a few would be interested that are on the line. Yes, yes, um, there is an evaluation version of the Elvis tree available. Um, it is something that we can certainly discuss. Um, it's it's basically it's the exact same Elvis tree you would pay full price for, um, but we give you it for I think fifty percent off, um, and then obviously you, you get it to keep forever. So if you decide, you know, this is definitely what we want to go for, and ten's a, the perfect number for you and your lab, then you only really need to buy nine, so you kind of get a little bit of a discount then. Um, Overall, um, yeah, you can get the evaluation version. Um, that is just with the Elvis, though. You can't get it with anything else, really. 
Richard, do you want to come in again? Yeah. We've one here from William Ronan. That many of us are in a scramble to put measures in place for next semester. Do you have any suggestions on high reward, low effort steps teaching staff can make? Any commercial package that is likely to take some time to get through procurement, etc. I think that was for you, Louise. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think it was meant for someone else. Um, so the question was if uh, there is any very low cost and straightforward uh, solution for enabling uh, remote access to an already existing hands-on lab, right? Something like that. Uh, so, uh, well, I mean, uh, you can do this basically for free, uh, but of course that means more work from your side. So if you move in this line from little work and, and or better said, a lot of work and quite some time to prepare and to the other extreme, which is little time and not much work to, to prepare, then you go for from free to commercial solutions. So you have a wide variety of options there, but um, but yes, there, there are several, certainly there are several uh, tools that you can you can browse and, and search for that will help a lot on uh, getting your uh, remote labs uh, operative. Uh, for example, I, I developed in the last years a, a, a tool to enable access to any uh, MATLAB or LabVIEW program. So if you have any MATLAB or LabVIEW uh, program controlling your already existing hands-on laboratory, then you can basically download this software from GitHub, uh, which is you know open source and, and free and so on. Uh, uh, install it and you know get through the README and so on. And then you have uh, internet communication to those uh, to those programs that control your hardware. So once you have that, then you just need to to you know get a, a, a user interface in a web application which you can build in, in many ways, you can do that from scratch, which is more work, or you can again use uh, open source uh, tools that are out there, like uh, uh, EC Java JavaScript simulations, or, or things like that, which are tools that help you to build web applications more easily without having to program so so much, and so you do not need, you know, this knowledge about JavaScript HTML programming. So with that, you you could transition your hands-on lab to a basic remote lab without too much work, I would say, but still, you know, it is some work, of course. Great. So I, yeah, I can, I can wrote the, some, some links here uh, for him if he is interested. That would be very helpful, uh, Luis. Thanks uh, for that. Uh, Irene, I'm going to ask you a question because I thought it was really interesting some of the solutions um, that uh, were coming out from the survey. Maybe you could tell us about some of the, those novel solutions being proposed for the upcoming academic year. Yeah, of course, Una. Um, certainly there's a few things that are repeating in other people's presentations. I think Michael had mentioned uh, an idea that half of the group would be in a lab in the practical and half attending online, for example, and that did come through on the survey results. Um, so the student in the lab would be paired with the student online. So you're doing everything you can that is reasonably practical to keep going with the education and some and then swap out the students then on a weekly basis so everyone gets the chance for the hands-on learning. Learning. And it ties in as well with what Brian was saying uh, in terms of flipped classrooms and, and trying to front load as much as possible online demonstrations and practicals and assessments for the practicals in the labs before actually attending on site on campus to do those things. So that's come through in the survey. So there's a lot of parallels there. Um, the idea of personal kids being taken home again and collaborating with teammates on Microsoft Teams has come through again. So peer working, peer review, project based learning again. And a lot of the things that Louis and Michael have mentioned too, they have actually come through on what people are planning in terms of the solutions uh, for this academic year for the practicals and laboratories. Um, and just to quote one person as well, there's a few really long ones, but the one here uh, in, in electrical and electronic engineering, um, that particular institute has bought 120 individual kits 
that allow students to be at home to work with their individual kit and replicate the lab. Um, so again, just sort of what Mike was mentioning, those working fully individually and remotely for all of their labs. And then it just a salient point really that alas, it's not available in civil or chemical engineering labs as such. Uh, but again, Brian had alluded to the fact that maybe we can start to think outside the box and look at other options there um, in, in that context too. Uh, you know, from a civil perspective, I see Jamie has a comment in the chat there, which Michael has answered relating to using particular software for materials lab for example so again there are options out there and um, I think Brian put his finger on the pulse of what everyone is thinking really when he said that we should all start sharing um, our ideas you know I, I personally would love to see some academic or scholarly papers as well on the back of all of this so that we can start to build and disseminate a body of knowledge uh, from an academic perspective but not necessarily immediately now I think everyone really needs just um, quick ideas quick solutions you know and as William had, had asked there kind of a low um, cost but high return you know and really working together working collaboratively probably will help with that and that does seem to be that that's come through in the survey findings as well. Thanks, Great. Excellent, Irene. And I, I'm glad you mentioned that about um, uh, papers uh, being produced out of this, because there's so much happening. We need more of those papers. Mm -hmm. And I know, uh, Sefi, the, the, the European Society of Engineering Ec Education have an annual conference and are always looking for papers to feed in. But it's something we ourselves as an academic society will look to promote that in, in Ireland also. Uh, Richard, do you have another question there that's coming in? I do. I have a related question, um, one about pre-recorded experiments and one about MOOCs. So the first, um, in terms of, uh, this is from Michael O'Shea, in terms of solutions, what about pre-recorded experiments with video files shared online? For example, Imperial College London have such material available through Expedition Workshed for Civil and Structural Engineering. I've used these good effects to support teaching of fundamental concepts such as strut buckling, um, this does not require time to set up or a lot of equipment knowledge and students can freely access themselves. There's also a question from Robert Sis uh, Simpson on are there MOOCs, that's massive open online courses, or free demos that could be used or adapted instead of doing all the preparation? So that's two questions, one on pre-record experiments and another on MOOCs. Um, will I take that? I think my name is mentioned there from Michael O'Shea's question. Um, yeah, I think that to some extent that relates to what are the learning outcomes you're trying to achieve. If the students are only going to watch videos, obvious, it seems that they're not going to learn anything about the operation of the equipment, which is which is possibly fine. If that, if you want to, uh, you do mention there that it's about teaching concepts. So if you want to teach the concept of buckling of a strut. Uh, videos would probably be great and there may be some really professional videos you don't even have to create them they are available elsewhere so I think that is a really good solution but it is an example of you examining the learning outcomes of your whole subject and finding ones where you say I'm not trying to teach about equipment here I just want to teach a concept so I don't need them in a lab um, so I think it is one of the many solutions, yeah. And by the way, uh, join the group and share that link to those to those videos. Great. Um, Am I okay to add on the back of that? Go ahead, yeah, Mike. Um, yeah, just the kind of research that we done at NI, um, we seen that um, when people done, uh, you know, used videos rather than having students with actual practical using the equipment, the student surveys. Of, the student feedback is obviously not as good. So really, if you need to use it, I would say go ahead. But as Brian mentioned, it's better that they actually have the practical hands-on experience. Um, and then I think with, uh, what was his name? Uh, let me look at the question again. Um, Robert Simpson, um, he also asked like using adapted free demos. Um, the Elvis 3 stuff that I mentioned, we have courseware pre-built for it that you can use in your own curriculum. Um, so yeah, like you can go on and you can trial that online just now if you'd like. Um, and not, we know a lot of people who just rather than them having to build up this course material, they've just used their course material instead. Um, so yeah, the, there is loads of stuff out there, and we've got multiple examples of people using it. 
Thanks, there Michael. A, there was a question there about MOOCs as well. Uh, and it has to be said that MOOCs have not concentrated on practical skills. They are doing some work, some of, uh, I think it might be edX or possibly Coursera that have bought a company that are working on trying to get practical work, practical challenges uh, integrated into MOOCs, but it looks like it's only, it's only simulations. Which is of great benefit itself, itself. But again, that that sort of uh, uh, I think illustrates where there's a crossover between what we want to do in labs and what we want to do in teaching in general. There is some argument that if you are trying to reduce contact with your students, if you're going to flip the classroom, find a MOOC online and let the students take the MOOC, and then you can meet them at various points, either face to face or online to tease out issues that arise. Great, uh, Brian. Just a couple more questions. Uh, I see Marion McAfee has sent one in for Louise. Um, how can we access your online lab infrastructure? Well, it's, it's of course not my uh, online lab infrastructure, but my university inf uh, online lab infrastructure. Um, it is not openly accessible. It is you know, it is reserved for our students and also for some other collaborator universities students. So there are a few universities that have collaborated with us in, in certain technical aspects, or there are also some universities that have also provided one online labs, one uh, experimental rig that it is placed, located in their labs. And so that we form like a, a network in which we share uh, laboratories and they can only be used by the universities that are part of this network. So if you are interested in, in joining the network by provide, providing, you know, uh, creating one remote lab in your institution and uh, putting them, putting it accessible in the network or, uh, you know, collaborating technically with some of the tools or whatever, then of course you are, you are welcome. But as I said, they are reserved for people that are somehow engaged or participating in, in this. Great. Uh, thanks, Louise, for that. Uh, I see another question from Kevin Delaney. Are there any health and safety concerns in terms of students bringing their own kit home and performing experiments at home? Anyone like to answer that one? Perhaps, Michael, there was electricity involved there. Yes, yeah, sorry, what was the question again? Or the okay. health and safety one? Are there any health and safety concerns in terms of students bringing their own kit home and performing? And performing experiments at home. Um, I've never in my time working with NI and speaking to colleagues who've been in working with academia a lot longer than me. Um, we've never encountered an issue with somebody having hurt themselves or running into some kind of issue <laughs> issue at home. Um, yeah, I mean the the devices that I mentioned they don't work at a high enough voltage or high enough amperage to really hurt anyone. Um, so it's it's not something I would really worry about too much, to be completely honest with you. Um, and to to me, like uh, I've got a, my DAC somewhere, it's under my desk somewhere, but um, it's no more dangerous than a, a laptop. Uh, possibly, um, you know, the students could sign um, risk assessments, do a risk assessment on it uh, before they take the kit home uh, and that, uh, like when they go on a field trip, maybe something like that could be involved. Final question I'm, I'm giving, uh, because we're coming close to the end. Uh, really, this is from Katrina Day before, a really interesting solutions, thanks to all speakers. I'm just wondering, is anyone, any ideas on low tech uh, labs such as soils or concrete? And uh, she's thinking of recording labs herself with a technician and streaming to students. Any suggestions there? I might comment on that because, or maybe Irene has some suggestions that have come into her, but it is one that I've thought about for years, having done civil engineering myself, is how can you crush concrete cubes? How can this be done remotely? But I have to say, uh, and a lot of that, in, in becoming a, a, a civil engineering, you're really learning about design, not necessarily about testing this. So I often thought it, it to me, watching somebody break 
uh, a reinforced concrete beam in a lab is quite exciting. <laughs> Maybe I'm a bit sad, but I find it quite exciting. So I would quite be, I'd be quite interested in seeing somebody do this live in a lab and streaming it out live rather than a recording and where we can all watch the displacement of the beam and possibly have a camera that is able to see how it breaks. I think you could achieve a lot like uh, with that and, and, and maybe with other experiments. In other words, we don't necessarily need to do them, but seeing them close up being done achieves a lot of the learning outcomes. But again, I'm not particularly expert in that, and that's where we need to get a group of civil engineers with ideas together to see how we might best do that. Now, that's a, a good final point there, uh, Brian. Uh, we've come to the uh, 11.30, which I, I said we were going to close the webinar on. I think there's been some very good exchanges, great ideas from the speakers. It makes the point of us continuing with this academic society and with these webinars to sharing expertise as we move forward. Uh, the committee meets next week and we'll be looking at what way we disseminate what we've got. And we will be providing uh, the links to the Engineers Ireland TV and so on um, going forward. We'd really value uh, feedback and suggestions. So yeah, anything that you have for future webinars, send it there to our sector support at engineersireland.ie. And then lastly, I'd just like to thank all of you who participated. I think at one stage I counted over 170 people. I'd like to particularly thank our speakers, Irene, Louise, Michael, and Brian, for all the preparation you did in, in, in presenting here today with us. I'd like to thank my fellow Academic Society Committee members, in, in particular, um, Anne Morrissey, who worked with us on the survey, and Will Ronan, our secretary, who helped us as well. And, and a big thank uh, to Engineers Ireland staff, uh, in particular, Richard Manton, uh, the Deputy uh, Registrar, Maureen Niangasa, John Byrne, Elvo Doherty, and Anne-Marie Clark. Thank you to all of you. And uh, with that, I'd just like to say goodbye and hope we meet again at future webinars. Thank you so much. <laughs>